Here are 10 intermediate Z Russian mistakes that are holding you back. Watch these videos to make sure you never make these mistakes and waste time. I made another video on amateur mistakes. While you're with us, we might as well complete this and I'll remind you at the end. I've also added a bonus at the end with many more videos lined up. So if you want more tips, subscribe and look out for those releases and let's see some intermediate mistakes. So when I'm teaching students at uni, I see this a lot. It's a really frustrating one and hard to undo, but get this concept that every brush has a front facing effect and a back facing effect. So what that means is when we have a thin piece of object, maybe like a bit of cloth, every time I sculpt on it, it's gonna affect the other side. So if you wanna turn that off, what we need to do is go into brushes and then go down to auto masking. And then under auto masking, we've got something called back face mask. And what that's gonna do is gonna change the brush so every time we're pasting onto something, it's not going to affect the back face or it's masking the back face. This one could be holding you back in terms of speed and efficiency. Allow me to elaborate. So basically when you've got a project, it might be tempting to keep everything in folders and work from that project. It's going to tank you down in terms of frame rate and moving around and sculpting. What you ideally want to do is take things off to the side inside of your project as separate subtools and work on them independently. And then what you're going to do is you're going to create a proxy or a representation of that mesh and then bring it back to your main project where you can position it. So in this example with Yoda, I've got this proxy for a potion and then I've got in my tools the actual physical potion that I'm going to be baking later and then just replacing. So the workflow is very important, especially if you're in the games industry. This potion is a lot less geometry, so it's easier to manage. And I've got a full breakdown if you find on the YouTube channel and I might leave a link in the bottom. So this one every artist knows, but they don't utilize it very much when they're sculpting, and that is masking. So if you're an intermediate, you really want to get used to masking. You can do a lot of things. So for example, if you're putting some surface detail and it's very brute force, what you can do is protect parts of the mesh so you're not going to actually affect that area. It's also very useful for moving certain elements. So if I wanted to overlap a certain section, for example, I could mask this, then use a very large move brush and then just tuck it underneath. Um, there's also other options. So for example, if you had limbs, you can mask a limb and then use the gizmo to rotate that off to the side. So always remember that you can mask. So at intermediate level, these naturally get a bit more specific, but I can guarantee at some point in your career, you might stumble across this. So it's good to know it now. When you're smoothing and surface detail isn't going away, chances are you accidentally have surface noise on. So you just want to tick that off. A common secondary one is that you may have a texture that's sort of like tiling on top of that object. Chances are that you accidentally have a texture map on. So go on to texture map and just turn it off. Very, very common. I see it a lot in, in the industry. Take heed on this one when you're sculpting something, especially clothing, a lot of people overuse the Z remesher function. So Z remesher and subdivisions are going to reduce your options when it comes to attaching things together. And it can be quite compelling to add that because you think it's going to look better. Uh, try and keep in DynaMesh as long as possible. You can always add a lot of resolution to it as long as your computer can handle it. And even sometimes in the industry, we don't even bother adding all those subdivisions. We literally just bake what we have on the DynaMesh. So if it's not looking too bad and too pixelated from a distance, it's totally fine to use DynaMeshing. Consider this, in your career, you're probably used to sculpting organics, but at some point in your career, you might be required to do things like hard surface or rocks. Now those require a completely different set of techniques and brushes. And if you're using your old UI systems and hotkeys, you're gonna be very inefficient. So if you are doing a new project, for example here, I'm gonna be using a lot of trim and H polish. I suggest going in preferences enabling customization and maybe dragging off a couple of these brushes that you're going to use a lot. You don't have to save them into your store config, but you can just have it for that scene that you're doing and on that day. What I often like to do is I actually like to drag that button, the enable customization up to the top right. So I can always at a click without going into a menu, adjust my UI for the thing that I'm doing at the very moment. I want you to know that you need to be very dynamic when it comes to sculpting, especially when it comes to lightness and heads. So move your camera around a lot and take every single angle from the top, from the bottom, inside the nose, inside the ear. Also at the same time, under the lighting sections, we can change the light direction. And this is gonna obviously adapt our highlights so we can see the surface that we're sculpting. And it's also gonna change the shadows. Don't be afraid to do some ugly stuff, like put the light extremely from the bottom, and then we can see different shapes that we wouldn't have normally seen. And then we can basically try and make this the best we can physically make it. 
Picture this, it's 2017 and Pixelogic hasn't implemented a folder system or a multi-select system. In this project, for example, all my sub objects are left open. Fast forward a couple of years and now we can put things into folder. So for 120 sub tools, it's very easy to manage. But further to that, it gives you a lot of access to different features. So if I've got sub tools in a folder, I can hit the cog menu and transpose them all together and move them independently. I can also merge folders down into one or clone it off to the side. So keep everything into folders just for management's sake and also to give you lots of additional features. So this one's a bit of a change of tone, uh, but I want to be brutally honest. So as an art director, I employ a lot of characterists and at university, I obviously teach people to become characterists. And what I see often is an over-reliance on base meshes. So when you're learning, the only person that you're tricking is yourself. And it's sad to see on a lot of submissions, I'll see many, many base meshes. And when those graduate, I see that they don't get jobs. So obviously in the industry, we can use base meshes if you are experienced, because we get saved time with topology and UVs, but please don't focus on the end or the outcome. Don't focus on the quick wins. It's a process to becoming a professional. So I thought I'd just mention that. So what I want you to know, and I see a mistake a lot of times is not reusing a lot of elements or making the most out of a character. So this, for example, I can reuse these eyes on another project, or for example, I've created a tool that generates nuts and bolts and stitches. I can take that off to the side and use it. So that just involves going into your separate sub tools and potentially under brushes coming and creating an insert mesh. So research how to do that. So here's the bonus tip and mistake. And I bet if you're a pro number six, you hadn't been using that much. So go back and just look at that. I'm going to do another additional video of the same format on professional mistakes. So make sure you go and follow on to that video. So with this bonus, it's more about how you're using your references. So often you'll have pure F off to the side, but what you actually want to do is bring everything into your ZBrush scene. And what I've done here is created an outline in Photoshop. So I can see my reference to the left and I can also adjust with the move tool, my object around this outline. So that's going to help you adhere to the concept if you're extremely religious with matching it and you want to get that vibe across. So I'm going to show you how to do that quickly now. If I press texture, click this button, it's going to dock it to the side. I can then click import. That's going to import our outline, the one that I made in Photoshop. So I might make a video on how I do that later. So make sure you subscribe. So once we import that, I can select the texture in this texture set. And then with this button, add to spotlight, it's going to bring it into the canvas scene. And then with this gizmo, I can basically adjust the scale and the opacities and things like that. If I press Z, I can then come back to sculpting mode and then obviously use the move brush to match and adhere uh, my references to this sort of silhouette. You can also press Shift Z and that's going to get rid of all the references. So really useful instead of having everything off to the side. So your next progression is to go onto the professional video. Even if you're not a professional, just check it out so you can get some useful bits of information. If you got useful information from this one, like it. So I understand that you like this sort of format. Also subscribe. I'm going to be releasing loads of different amounts of content. Down there, if you're interested in becoming a character artist, I've added a Discord channel. So people are joining that and giving video suggestions and talk about the industry. I'm giving a little bit of feedback as well. Um, and also down there, I've added a link to a download for a welcome package. So check that out. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.